Well, joining me now is Andrew Tate, whose videos have been viewed billions of times online, but he's been banned from pretty much every mainstream social media platform, including Twitter. Uh, Andrew Tate, uh, welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Um, your take on this, I think, is quite interesting because you've been a victim of being... Uh, if victim's the right word, but you've been removed from social media platforms for your opinions. Um, Elon Musk has dedicated himself, he says, to restoring free speech. Uh, do you think that's going to include you, for example? I don't think it matters if it includes me or not. I think what's important is that free speech is the number one weapon against absolute tyranny. And although you cannot have complete free speech because then conversations completely break down into asinine insult fests. I do like the idea of the changing of the guard when it comes to control over information. Is it possible, Andrew Tate, to actually police something like Twitter, to, to be a platform for genuine free speech? Or is it so toxic and tribal now that whatever happens, you know, before we had all the all, people on the right screaming away that they were being no-platformed and so on. Now you've got all the people on the left screaming that they're being no, uh, you know, diminished in some way. Uh, it's, it's very tribal, very toxic. Can Musk cut through that? And if so, how? Yeah, it's going to be extremely difficult. There's always going to be one group of people who are extremely unhappy, but I think that anybody who's perspicacious enough to understand the truth of what's been going on in the world recently will know that the left and their narratives have certainly been protected for a very long time. And the universe has swings and balances, and God often restores balance to the universe, and perhaps it might swing the other way for a while. I truthfully am a person who believes that all points of view are extremely important because as soon as you block points of view, you have absolute tyranny. And in a way, it's sort of self-defeating, isn't it? Because you carried on getting huge attention. It was interesting to me that when you came on the show, for example, we've had, I think, nearly six million people have viewed the whole interview that we did, which is a huge number of people, certainly far higher than watched it on conventional television. So you have a whole, you have a whole world out there online which operates away from social media platforms. Yeah, uh, I've been very, very successful in spite of them, but not many people can do that. Uh, I, I'm in a pretty unique position, but I think that everybody needs a voice to a degree. And social media platforms are now the most important platforms on the planet. They control information and they influence real world decisions and they influence people's perception of reality. The last few years of COVID have been a perfect example of what happens when you censor one side of the argument and you only allow one point of view to be purported by the matrix in and of itself. And that's how you end up in tyrannical situations. I think you were just discussing that, Piers. Yeah, and I think that's a perfectly valid point. You know, people have quite, I think, quite rightly held me to task over some of the positions I took during the COVID pandemic, uh, notably when the scientists said, as a definitive fact, that you, you couldn't transmit the virus if you had the vaccine. It turned out that wasn't true. And I based my observations on that supposed fact and said, right, well, in that case... If you refuse to be vaccinated, you shouldn't get the same rights as people who've been vaccinated. If, if it's true that if you're unjabbed, you can pass it on. It turned out, actually, there's not much difference whether you've been vaccinated or not. And at that point, I changed my mind. Uh, uh, but I, I felt that yeah, there were a lot of people who were being deplatformed from Twitter at the time for questioning the validity of scientific statements, and they would then be a complete U-turn. So I do think it was a very interesting period actually, for testing what free speech it was means. Actually, it was actually worse than... that. You're right, Piers, but it was actually worse than interesting because what happens is when you censor an entire side of the argument and only allow one side of the argument to have a voice, you are changing reality in real time. You are shaping the world. The only reason that scam continued as long as it did and the only reason people didn't get to see their own parents get buried and the only reason people sat and mass missed cancer appointments because they were scared of the common cold was because they were censoring anybody who said anything contrary to the purported version of events that the mainstream media decided they want the entire world to swallow. It's beyond simply interesting and it's beyond simply uh, funny or coincidental. Yeah, they are I mean, I will, look, I, will, I will challenge you on one thing. It's not the common cold, right? COVID-19 has killed 6.6 .6 million people. It is one of the most deadly viruses, certainly, of our lifetime. So it wasn't the common cold, but I do think it is completely justified well, for people to say we should be more cautious, I think, about accepting during fast-moving pandemics 
the word of scientists as being sacrosanct because on a number of things from the use of masks to the efficacy of vaccines in preventing transmission, they did massive U-turns. I've read enough history books to know that the people who do the censoring are never the good guys. And they've been censoring a lot of arguments for a very long time in the name of good. They are weaponizing virtue, and it's always in the name of tyranny. Anybody who is out here trying to silence an entire side of an argument on any subject, whether it's COVID-19, immigration, anything else, they are the evil people who are out for absolute mind control of the populace. And they well, should I be certainly, I certainly agree. I certainly agree that I think the healthiest thing for any de democracy is for all views to be aired and debated. We seem to have lost the ability to debate. You know, when I interviewed you, yeah, we had a few fractious moments, but actually, I thought it was a pretty spirited debate between people who perhaps had, you know, preconceived views of each other. And I've got no problem interviewing you now about these because I think you have an interesting uh, take on this stuff. And that's the key to life. When you reach that level of adolescence in your mindset where you can't handle any point of view that is contrary to your own, then you're truly a broken person. And that's what the internet is purporting. It's very interesting you said about Twitter being tribal. There's a large contingent of people on Twitter who simply cannot handle reading an opinion which differs from their own. And that yeah. is a degree of immaturity that we do not need adults to be functioning with in the modern world. No, I agree. Uh, if you were Elon Musk, this idea of charging $8 now a month, uh, whatever it is, to access the blue tick premium Twitter account, would you do that? Would you pay the extra? I think that social media companies for a very long time have lived in an absolute fantasy where they've printed money from thin air by charging people for pixels and they grew into these large conglomerates with too many staff sitting around doing nothing, having coffee breaks. And Elon Musk is a businessman. He's walked into the office and he's firing a bunch of people who are messing around doing nothing and he wants his business to make money as it absolutely should. And how he decides that happens is his prerogative. I don't see why we should sit and accept that a website needs 200,000 people sitting around discussing in long meetings, sitting on beanbags about policy of human rights, of some garbage, when he's come along and said, no, I'm a businessman, we're going to charge for our service, we're going to reduce the number of staff, and we're going to be a functional, coherent company, as they should be. And that's, it's his prerogative to do it as he's bought the company. I think he can do whatever he wants. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree, because I remember the appalling censorship of the New York Post exclusive... Uh, about Hunter Biden, the son of the president, about his laptop. This is three weeks before the, the election that Joe Biden won. Uh, he was heading, you know, to a possible victory, but it was tight. And that story, they reckon, could have tipped it either way. But it was completely suppressed and censored, uh, starting with Twitter, then Facebook, then others. Twitter literally locked out the New York Post account for two weeks for breaking a completely true story. And I thought that was shameful. When it's worse than shameful. It's worse than shameful. When you control information, you control the real world. They affect the real world in absolute, in real time. They are genuinely affecting the reality people live in. They are not just a company. They're not just a social media platform. It affects absolutely every single person on the planet when it changes who is elected. I don't want to comment specifically on Hunter Biden or the laptop. I would never kill myself. But I don't think it's fair that they would put, hide certain key information that close to an election. And the fact that they've done that was done specifically to affect to affect the world that we all live in. And we all have to suffer the consequences of those things. So to sit and say that these companies can just do whatever they want and they're private, etc. No, free speech is beyond important for democracy. It's important for the reality that we exist under. Andrew Tate, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you, friend.